Hi everyone and welcome along to another edition of the Celtic View podcast. In this very special Cult Heroes edition and what a guest we've got on this week. Let's welcome him straight in. He scored 20 goals in 59 appearances for Celtic over three years but none of those goals was more important than that one against St Johnson on the final day of the league season in 1998. A goal which I think deserves a round of applause as we welcome in, it's Harold Brackback. Harold, <laughs> how are we? Are you well? Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm well. I'm fine, thank you. Very good. <laughs> so before we get into the career, just give everyone an update of what you're doing at this moment in time in your life, where you're based, because I think you've got quite a, an interesting job at the moment. Yes, uh, I'm still fine, uh, which I've done for the past almost uh, 15 years now and I uh, well there's been a yeah everyone knows what's been happening in the last two years there's there's been a bit of uh, of cutoffs along the last two years but now I'm back flying again uh, full time so that's um, that's good the the world seems to be working uh, as it should again so uh, I'm, I'm happy to be back back flying so that's uh, my main uh, main uh, activity at the moment yeah i mean most footballers when they retire they'll go into television punditry they'll go into coaching i mean this is a bit one of the more unusual avenues to go down so how did it all come around well i i had an interest of flying uh, even when i was uh, well i I didn't, didn't have the interest as to fly when i was uh, a young boy uh, obviously as every Every kid, you will look up to the sky when you hear a plane passing over you. But it wasn't until uh, I was a bit older that I got interest of flying. And uh, when I hung up my boots, I, I had already decided I wanted to pursue a career in, in aviation. So uh, it's uh, it's something that started a couple of years before I hung up my boots because I knew it was going to take a lot of time and effort to, to do it. But I, I really wanted to do something uh totally different and uh yeah as you say it's uh it's uh it's a long way from uh celtic park celtic <laughs> park to forty one thousand feet <laughs> i mean a lot of players when they retire they talk about missing the buzz of a, of a changing room and the pressure of that environment but i mean the pressure that you've got in your shoulders as well that you must sort of still get that adrenaline and that thrill from flying well, yes, I do. Uh, it's really a very good job, and I, I really enjoy it, uh, especially nowadays. Actually, because uh, I mean, when this interview is taking place, it's it's a period of uh, a lot of extreme weather here in Norway. So we have our challenges when we fly, but it's uh, it's always it's the same as on the on the on the park when you get challenges when you play against good teams and good good defenders. You try to get past them and then make that extra effort to to help the team, and that's that's what it's about flying as well. Trying to uh, conquer the the conditions as good as possible. But obviously, the big difference is that uh, there's not much room for error when you fly. So uh, I, we have to be extremely care- careful and cautious as well. But uh, it's fine. It's uh, it's all been taken care of through the through the all through the um, through the, all the tr- good training we get. So uh, it's. Um, it's still a, a long way from football, but at the same time, uh, it's very rewarding when you uh, when you reach your goals uh, also in the air. Yeah, I'm just glad and I know someone that if I ever need a, a cheap flight, I can give a phone call. So expect one very soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, That's fine. You're welcome. <laughs> well, I want to get into, into your career, obviously, Celtic being the, the main talking point, but I want to go right back from to the beginning of your, your journey as a footballer growing up um, in, in Trondheim in Norway. What was life like for you as a youngster? And was it always football that you you wanted to try and dream of playing? Uh, not in the beginning. I started, as you said, here in Trondheim uh, playing football. But at the same time, we started playing handball as well. So until the age of actually, um, I think I was at least 18, when I played both handball and football, when I, when I became 18 and I had to make a choice because it wasn't possible because we also had uh, a few of us had a chance to, to play at a high level, also in handball. So we, uh, we had to make a choice and I chose football. And uh, uh, But up until that age, I played both, uh, both um, sports and it was really 
a different story then because uh, normally during the winter time we where the handball was the main focus and uh, the football was the main focus when we got to the the summer but uh, nowadays obviously all sports are more or less uh, year round so that's it's not possible at, uh, today to to make it that far in several sports though uh, and also another difference is that uh, now if you're a good footballer you will be uh, picked up by some academy at an early age uh, when I was playing there's no such thing as an academy so I was just lucky to be uh, seen by one of the coaches of uh, Rosenberg when I was I think it was 17 or 18 so uh, a lot has changed but um, still I had good um, um, good youth I had a stable place to be family was behind me all the time of course and uh, just bit by bit I understood that uh, football could be one of my uh, one of my uh, favorite pastimes. That's really interesting that you had to decide between handball and football. Was it a tough decision at that moment? I mean, you must look back now and think I made the right choice. <laughs> yes, I uh, I always do think I make the right choices, but uh, <laughs> at that moment, uh, I I knew that uh, there was also clubs uh, at a higher level here in Trondheim that uh, wanted me uh, part of their squad in the handball as well, but. Um, I felt that I had maybe more uh, more talent, and I think I had more to, uh, to gain from pursuing the footballing career. But uh, uh, well, I had a choice made made that to be football, and that was when I was eighteen. And from there on, it was just uh, has just been a very interesting ride all the time, all the way, because it's uh, I wasn't playing at a long time at my local club uh, at senior level before I was uh, picked up uh, from Rosenberg. So um, from there on in 1990, it must have been, uh, everything uh, went quite fast. Yeah, you, you started off, as you said, at, at Rosenberg. You also had a, a loan spell at, at Bodo Glimpse as well. Um, and that seemed to be the place where you really started to get in and amongst the goals. Was that quite an important moment for you in your career? Because I think you won a, won a Region Cup at your time there, didn't you? Yes, that's right. Uh, there was a couple of the players that it was made that uh, didn't uh, get into the squad uh, or weren't uh, given so many chances to play uh, for the coming seasons. So I was one of the players that wanted to leave for for a, for a more secure place in the team. Uh, and believe it was uh, was the one team that I chose. And obviously, that was two of my early years, and that was two very good years. I was able to play all the time. I was given. Uh, trust by the, the manager to, to play all the games as well and uh, I was there for two years and as you said uh, we won the, the cup uh, in the second year and uh, the following year I came back to Rosmerg again and that was in 94 so so from there on I was uh, I was a part of the squad in, in Rosmerg for four years until I joined uh, Celtic then I mean when you go back to Rosenberg I mean I think that's your goal scoring record, I was looking back on it over the last couple of days. Your goal scoring record was unbelievable in, in that time when you go back to Rosenborg. What was it about the time when you went back? Did something just click for you at your time there? Yeah, I think so. Uh, as I said, I had some really good experience in Podoglimp by playing regularly. Uh, we went straight from the second tier to the, to the Premiership. Uh, so we also had a, um, um, uh, a run of very good games, and I, I must say, uh, having the, um, the chance to play regularly at an early age, at a young age, is is really important. And for me, I think I, I just uh, I think the the pieces of the puzzle just uh, fell into place uh, bit by bit uh, uh, as my career went along. So uh, coming back to Rosenberg and being able to play at the highest level again. Um, regularly uh, in 94 was uh, just part of my my uh, development but uh, it's it's not always uh, a certainty that you're going to get play playing games and, and be having success but for me it was um, the right time to go back it uh, I, we I did fit well into the team as well and uh, I think uh, for those who have seen the the record of uh, the Rosberg team in in those years would also see that we had a lot of success. So, so yes, I was uh, both good, but also very lucky to be part of such a successful team. 
Yeah, because I think at this moment in time, Rosenborg aren't, probably aren't a team as they were back in those uh, periods in the 90s and, and early 2000s. So just explain to people how big of a force Rosenborg were at that time because they were a real sort of household name in Europe regularly competing in the, in the Champions League. Yes, I think uh, you, uh, you touched on that subject, uh, talking about how things clicked. Uh, I think we were a good squad, we had a good manager and we were able to play for a long time together uh, as a team. So we were able to um, to collectively uh, become a strong team. Uh, and uh, the first time we really made ourselves uh, visible on the on the international uh, scene was in 1995 when we first uh, um, qualified for the Champions League. And we played against the IFK uh, Gothenburg and they were the the Scandinavian household name for European success at that time. So it was uh, kind of a turning point when we met them away in the first game in Sweden and we beat them, I think it was 3-2. So uh, from there on, we, as you said, we became a regular team in uh, in on the national scene. And I think from uh, 1995 until 2004, that was 10 years in a row in the Champions League. So... Uh, we, we, yeah, we really made uh, a name for ourselves as well, but um, it was part of a um, uh, success for Norwegian football as well because we, we de- developed a lot of good players and uh, yeah, for the likes of me and, and many others, we were also able to, um, to go through to other big clubs in, in Europe uh, in that period. Yeah, that run you're talking about there, 1995 to 2004, I think that was actually a record in the Champions League at the time for a team consecutively making the group stages. And when you were in those group stages, I mean, you had some amazing moments. You scored at the San Siro to, to knock AC Milan out in 1997. You scored against Real Madrid and a famous win there. Like, what were those experiences like for you? They must have really sort of catapulted you onto that next level. Well, I think, first of all, we, we were uh, very aware of what we were able to achieve. Uh, we, we knew what, what level we could play at. And once you start playing against the good European teams, and once you see that they're also flesh and bone, not supernatural, you see that it, there is a chance if you play well. And I think that's uh, what we um, really um, uh, took advantage of uh, when we played against those teams, because because we we knew that if we had a good good day, we we could uh, play well against anyone. And also, I mean, as you said, beating Real Madrid at home and also beating AC Milan away in the last group stages game uh, to go through to the quarterfinal uh, is something that just tells us that uh, it is possible. But uh, yes, it was really fun to be, be part of that. And I think even the biggest clubs in Europe uh, knew who we were. And uh, obviously that paved the way for, for me and many others to, uh, to go to other clubs uh, a few years later. Yeah, I was interested to see what the, the team lineups were for those AC Milan and Real Madrid games. And for yourself as a striker, you're going to the San Siro. They had a, a defence of Costa Carta, Berezi and Maldini. I mean, it doesn't get any harder than that as a, as a striker, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. But uh, I think uh, as the game, um, uh, game passed, I think... Uh, because we, uh, I think it was one-one until uh, till half time. Because I think they uh, equalised just before half time with Stefan Degari, the French striker. And I think they, uh, I think they knew when the second half started. I think they felt a little bit of pressure as well, because uh, they obviously didn't want to. For them, one-one was good enough, uh, but they didn't want to be um, kind of intimidated by us, uh, a small team from Norway. So uh, I think when we scored uh, the second goal, I think they really felt. The pressure and uh, they they were out then when we scored the second goal. So uh, all in all, it's just about handling the pressure and uh, even the good big teams also have have a bit of difficulty handling pressure at sometimes and especially when you meet teams that you think you're supposed to beat. So um, as you say, the, the 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 big names that played for that team they were still uh, they were still a bit nervous uh, towards the end of the game. Yes, I think over. So it was three years at Rosenberg, you scored close to 80 goals. You were scoring at San Siro against Real Madrid. I mean, you must have had teams from around Europe queuing up to try and, to try and sign you during that period. 
Yes, there was a few. Uh, I had some offers from Italy. I had some offers from uh, uh, Greece. And there were some French clubs as well. So there was a kind of uh, an interest, obviously, because we, we played well and uh, I scored a lot of goals. Uh, but it was uh, in the end, it was uh, Celtic that really made um, a really strong move uh, at that time uh, to, to get me over. And it was, uh, I don't think the negotiations, negotiations lasted too long that, the uh, fall in 97 because it was uh, quite obvious that Celtic wanted me and uh, I I really really fancied going to Celtic as well so uh, in the end it was uh, an easy choice when uh, when the offer was uh, was here. Yeah so that's December 1997 when you you finally come into the door at Celtic what was it about the club that enticed you so much to want to join Did, was there someone on the, the other side of the phone that was making a, a good case for you to, to sign for the club? Uh, I don't know. I think it was the whole club as itself. I mean, I was uh, really welcomed by all the all the players and staff. Uh, but before I came there, I, I had been there a time or two to to look at the look at the facilities and look at the club. And I think uh, I was uh, very impressed of, of the size of the club. Uh, so for me, coming to to Celtic was uh, was an easy choice when when. Uh, when I first had to make a choice, uh, but um, I also, uh, from my background in Rusmo for the last four years, I also had uh, a lot of experience from the international uh, scene. So for me, it wasn't um, wasn't that big a step. But I knew that I was going to be a bigger club, of course. But I had played on the international scene, so I was uh, fully aware of uh, of the pressure that would be when uh, when we. Well, had to play, uh, had to win the league, of course, and also uh, play in Europe. What did you know about the football club at, at that time? Because, of course, in that season, we're going to try and stop 10 in a row. We hadn't been as successful as we had in the past or, or played in Europe as, as regularly. So did you know a lot about the club or did a lot of it sort of take you by surprise when you came in? Uh, I knew a lot about the club because I had read a, read a lot about the club, of course, uh, before I came. Uh, and I also knew, obviously, the rivalry uh, in Glasgow between the two big clubs. Uh, but I, I don't think, and I've said that many times after as well, that I don't think I re realised how big the club was uh, when you look at the size on a worldwide basis, because uh, I, I was so surprised that, uh, and especially when I, I, I left Celtic, I was so surprised that when I everywhere I went, uh, I could see a Celtic shirt hanging in bars and at pubs and at restaurants all over the world. So uh, I don't think I really realized how big uh, the club was on a, on a worldwide basis before I left. But uh, obviously, yeah, as it is now, Celtic is still a, a strong big club in, in Europe and in the world. So uh, it's uh, definitely a step up from uh, from uh, from Rosmo where I played. Yeah, so take us back to those first few moments and days as a Celtic player when you arrive you you go into training for the first time was there was there anyone in particular that really sort of took you under their wing and tried to sort of help you acclimatize to life in Glasgow it's kind of interesting because uh, I, I really felt uh, welcome uh, right from the start because there was uh, there had been so many uh, players in um, there had been so many players in the in the squad that wasn't there before the season started. So I was, I think, maybe six, seven, or eight in in in, uh, in the line that was added onto the squad. Um, but uh, one of the players that uh, really uh, welcomed me, and that's kind of fun to say because uh, he was one of my rivals. That was Darren Jackson. He was. Uh, really nice and really welcoming to me. And uh, that was, uh, well, he had his uh, situation with his, with his um, uh, brain surgery as well, uh, just before I arrived. So so uh, I think he was just glad to be back. And he was, uh, even though we were rivals uh, at, uh, in, in practice all week, he was uh, really welcoming and he was, um, among others as well, uh, helping me to to fit into the dressing room. So um, that, I think also that shows a little bit of the, the character of the of the squad at that time. 
everyone wanted to help the team to be to be good. But uh, as I said, I was one of six, seven, eight signings that uh, that year, and um, I don't think there was many signings after me uh, before we ended that season. So, uh, so I, I I came into a dressing room that was uh, full of both old and new players, but. Uh, I found that the same uh, motivation and the same will to to pull in the same direction was um, was uh, equally as strong as it was uh, in Trondheim. Were, were there any players in those initial few days that you maybe didn't know about? I know you mentioned sort of Darren Jackson, but any others that, that took you by surprise as the quality they had, or anyone else that, that really sort of surprised you during those first few first few moments? Well, I think uh, I think uh, everyone. Uh, I mean, there were so many good players in that team, and uh, uh, I was uh, lucky to play alongside Morten Vighorst, uh, Tom Boyd, Jackie McNamara, uh, Stefan Mahe, uh, Henrik Larsson, uh, and uh, this. I mean, I, I couldn't mention all. I, I I could have mentioned the whole squad, but there were so many good quality players in that team. So I uh, I was really happy to be part of such a a really good team and uh, obviously uh, Paul Lambert I didn't mention him either but there was Craig Burley so there's just so many players and I think when I mention all those names I think it's um, it's more clear for the um, uh, for the fans to also understand that uh, the team was really good enough to to take home the title that year because obviously you you come in as we mentioned before. The big thing with that year is stopping the 10 in a row. When you're signing for the club, was that mentioned at all? Did, did you know much about it when you were coming in? Uh, the club uh, and the players and, uh, and um, yeah, the managers, uh, the support staff, uh, they didn't talk much about it. Obviously, uh, I mean, my first game as a starter was uh, was against Rangers on at the old firm at Ibro uh, at uh, Celtic Park on the second of January, ninety eight. So obviously, I got a, a little bit of taste of the <laughs> of the real thing when uh, when we played that game. But uh, but most of the the talk was done through media, and uh, if you read all the papers, you would go you would go get all the stories, but. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, I wasn't too eager to read all those papers. I think uh, also the managers, with uh, especially with uh, Wim Jansen and uh, Murdo McLeod, obviously very good managers. Uh, they were good enough and smart enough to uh, to focus on everyday session and and only the next game. They weren't focusing on uh, on winning the title. Uh, but obviously, when we came towards the end of the season, uh, that was becoming obviously the main target because we were so close. Do you think that helped the team get over the line eventually during the season that you didn't talk about it openly so much and you did just focus on game by game because you hear footballers talk about it all the time. We're just focusing on the next match, but it sounds like your team really did do that. I think that was a really big part of it. Uh, but I also think that because when you... Um, when you put together a squad, you you will also have all obviously have different personalities and different qualities uh, among the players. But I think uh, you get uh, you get a sense in the dressing room uh, how the squad is. And I think, um, as I said, Murdo and and Wim, they were good at getting us to uh, focus on uh, the next next session and the next game. But uh, I also think that the, a lot of the players were so professional that they also knew that this was a, a hard job and hard work that had to be done all through the season. And it, uh, I mean, just, it doesn't help to to beat Rangers two 0 at Celtic on the second of January if you if you lose the next game. So uh, I think that that was something that uh, uh, the players also knew knew uh, a lot about. And I think uh, uh, that experience and that. Um, how can I put it? That uh, knowledge about the game uh, throughout the squad was uh, instrumental of in in making uh, uh, making us able to to stop ten in a row. Well, that Rangers game, as you mentioned, in the second of January, I think when a lot of people look back in that season, 
they view that as a real turning point for the success that we ended up going on to have. When you look back on it in hindsight, was that a real pivotal and vital game in that season? I think it was, uh, because it was the start of a new year. It was the start of uh, of us uh, trying to uh, to um, yeah get in front of Rangers as well. And I think uh, the way we played that game, it was uh, obviously a, a very classical old firm game with a lot of speed, a lot of tension. But I think uh, in the end, when we won the game, I think I think that was really we uh, we got spurred on by by knowing that this was actually possible and uh, play we knew that we had I think we had one more game left against them at Ibrox uh, before the the season ended but then we knew that uh, everything was possible and uh, it then came down to winning all the rest of the games and I think uh, I cannot remember now but I think uh, our our um, our um, uh, statistics for that to, from the, at the last part of the season was quite good. I don't think we lost many games. I can't remember how many, but I don't think it was many. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and for yourself as well, personally, as you mentioned, your first start as a Celtic player coming in a, in a game like that. I mean, what was that experience like for you walking out onto the, onto the pitch for the first time with all the noise and all the colour of that, of that atmosphere? Oh, it was brilliant. Uh, luckily, I had experience from Rosmerg as well, playing against some of the best teams in Europe as well. Uh, so I knew what the... I thought I knew what the atmosphere would be like, but uh, obviously running on to, uh, to Celtic Park uh, against Rangers in an old firm game um, as a starter for the first time, that was something amazing. And I can remember I uh, took my two oldest kids back to Glasgow uh, when Celtic played Barcelona in the Champions League and when they won 2-1. Uh, and uh, I, I told my kids that uh, this was going to be a very special atmosphere. But uh, I think they just they were just blown away because they didn't know what was going to happen. It was so amazing for them as well. But I think I got kind of the same experience when I played against Rangers. But um, then again, uh, I was on the park I was able to participate in the game and, and, and try to do something good for Celtic. So, so I was focusing on that. But obviously, as a player, you take in all the, all the things that happen around you. And uh, I mean, uh, a full house at Celtic Park against Rangers. That's, um, I've said that to all my friends and everyone that's asked me about football. I said, if you're, if you're going to go and see one, if you're going to go to one, see, see one, um, one game, uh, which is a rivalry game. Uh, the old firm must be one of them because uh, if you haven't seen that, you haven't seen anyone, I think. Well, as you said, you've, so you've witnessed the, the atmosphere in the stands and obviously on the pitch as well. What is the difference when you're, you're on the park? Because so much is made about the atmosphere at Celtic Park and how it drives the team forward. But when you're on the pitch, do you sort of take all that in? Does it make such a big difference to you as a player? Uh, well, yes, sort of, uh, but you cannot make it the main focus because uh, your main focus has to be on on playing well, of course. But uh, there's, uh, um, I mean, the, the home crowd has definitely something to do about uh, about uh, the results in in in, in some games, and uh, for that game, I'm I'm sure that uh, the player number 12 in the stands was uh, really important for us and uh, and for us players it's it's all about trying to to um, not think too much about uh, the atmosphere but uh, there's obviously I mean um, I think it's hard to explain uh, for someone that hasn't been on the park uh, how good it is to be on the park in such a game uh, but I mean also um, uh, I can remember from talking to a lot of people afterwards and also talking to supporters from from the club uh, it's um, it's really it's really important for the for the the home team to have a good crowd in the back and that's was that's what we had and uh, they really helped us so uh, being part of the supporter team for for Celtic is uh, is something I think the supporters should be proud of as well because um, that's always helping 
Yeah, I mean, I find it hard enough to communicate playing five asides when there's no one there. So I can't imagine what it's like <laughs> trying to communicate with your teammates in front of 60,000 fans in a, in a match like that. Yes, it's, uh, it's actually a lot of things that you have to plan uh, before the game starts and you have to look at different scenarios because, uh, as you say, it's, uh, if you're not uh, on the sideline between the dugout, you, you will not be able to hear anything. So uh, sometimes you can get uh, messages through from, from the sideline via the, the players that are closest to the, to the dugout. But then again, it can also disappear in the, in the game itself. So uh, most of all, it's all about being well prepared. And uh, I think we were well prepared for all the games we played. Um, and uh, in addition to, to being professional and knowing what to do, because we've gone through all the all the systems and all the all the um, things we needed to be uh, during the, the training week so so uh, that's also come down to the to the to the managers as well because they are also playing a really important part in, in making the, the game day um, uh, as little stressful as possible yeah as you said the second half of that season we really started to to kick on and really started to improve as a team one of the more important games as well was, was in the February, a month later after the, the Rangers went home to Kilmarnock, a game I'm sure you, you'll remember really well. We went 4-0, mm -hmm. you score four goals. What was that experience like for you, getting, getting four goals in a match like that that was so important in the season? Uh, well, if you play for Celtic and you score four goals uh, at Celtic Park, uh, that just sums up your... your uh, uh, your career at, at at the club because it's it's really really amazing and it's uh, it's also re so rewarding to be part of a team that works so hard uh, to get the wins in. But I mean, I uh, I don't remember ever, all the goals I've scored, but I think one of the goals was just a tap in from Henrik as well, and that shows the professionalism and the uh, the unselfishness that uh, both he and the rest of the team played as well. And um, I think that's uh, yeah, I was just one. Well, I had the talent, of course, but I also was uh, lucky enough to be to be to be the one that was able to score four goals uh, in one game at Celtic Park. So uh, that's just um, yeah, I'm just really proud of being part of the team at that time. But I'm also obviously proud of being part of the the Celtic history. So uh, all those small things, all those games, all those goals, uh, they just add up to a, a really really great part of my uh, footballing history. I mean, not many people in the history of Celtic will have scored four goals in a game. So, I mean, it's some achievement for yourself at that time. Did you feel like things were, were starting to click for yourself personally and for the club and for the team in general? Well, I, I, I had a little bit of a slow start. I had a few games coming from the bench and uh, uh, I didn't score against the Rangers. I had a few chances to score in the game on the 2nd of January. But I think the team played well together. We got uh, we got a few games under the belt. We trained well, so so yes, uh, I would say that uh, during the period of yeah, I would say coming to March, maybe February, late, yeah, February March. I think we we could see that the team was really playing well together, and I felt I found my place as well. So uh, so it was really uh, rewarding to see the, the team uh, achieve so much success in the games that were to come and. Obviously, as I said, all the games that we played were so important to be able to put ourselves in, this, in, in, the, um, in a good position at the end of the season to be able to, to uh, clinch the title in front of the Rangers. Yeah, you said uh, Henrik set up a couple of your goals in that game. What was he like to, to play alongside? Because that was also his first season as a, a Celtic player and obviously clearly someone that went on to have an amazing career with the club and a really special player in our history. Yeah, I mean, he. Uh, I I rank Henrik as the best player I've played with, uh, and that doesn't come uh, as a surprise for anyone, I guess, because he played. I think it was seven seasons for Celtic, and he played also for Manu and Barcelona. So he's really made a, a brilliant career. But I think uh, what uh, what made him stand out from the crowd was his his uh, football smartness. He he wasn't maybe the biggest one. He wasn't maybe the one that was quickest. But he was so smart in all his passes. He was so smart in all his 
his choices on the on the on the park. So it was really uh, it was really uh, uh, really enjoy enjoyable to, to play alongside him. But we had, uh, as I said, we had the teams in all parts of the uh, players in all parts of the team that could uh, provide us with some extra. And Henrik was definitely one of them. So the months are ticking down in the season. Do you start feeling a bit nervous as the season's going on? Are you still treating things game by game? Because things are starting to hot up as we get towards the business end of the season. I think we're good at focusing on that. Uh, but obviously, uh, and when there is uh, so many games uh, coming in a row and you want to achieve the best for every game, it, it's it's obviously hard to keep the focus because um, we knew that one one slip up uh, against one of the less good teams in the in the league would would uh, make us make it impossible to 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 win the title. So so um, in all fairness, I think uh, all all the the, the guys were um, uh, smart enough to to really be focusing on the, on the on the important thing, uh, and that was obviously to do what was next on the plan and next on the schedule. But obviously, uh, uh, I would lie to you if I said that we we went on uh, playing all those games through the the last part of the season and not being nervous and not being excited. But I think that's also part of um, of being. Um, uh, a professional athlete it's 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 all about handling the pressure you get because if you are not uh, affected by the pressure then you're not uh, focused enough either so so i think uh, just trying to combine combine all those uh, feelings and emotions that come to you together with um, trying to get all your best your best performance out on the park every day i think that's that's uh, that's what makes a a professional athlete is good as well and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the total in, in the team was so good that uh, it made it possible for us to to be focused all the time. Would you do anything as a group sort of away from the pitch during those, during those last few months of the season just to try and take the pressure off a little bit whether it's maybe going out for lunches or, or drinks or anything like that like was there, was there anything in the squad that kind of kept it together? Oh yes, we, we did small small things like uh, getting a bacon roll at the uh, at the end of a session uh, in the dressing room, uh, going out for a lunch. Uh, we also had uh, I can remember we had, we had this I think we had a seventies party that was just after I arrived. Uh, I didn't have anything to wear, so I went to to shop and got something. And it was a really good uh, really good night because I remember waking up the next morning at home and I was supposed to clean the clothes or just throw them away and uh, <laughs> I found a steak in one of my pockets <laughs> so <laughs> some of the guys had uh, left some food <laughs> in the pocket of my jacket I didn't notice until the next day so so yes we did find um, some time to have some fun as well I think that was important I want to know who the best dress was at that that occasion <laughs> Oh, I couldn't though. I didn't. I certainly didn't have the best one. But uh, there was a there was a few good ones. Uh, uh, I cannot uh, remember now who was the best, but uh, at least it made us uh, have a good time together. I think uh, that's also important to to make the team work well. There was a lot of big characters in the Celtic team at that time. Who were the main people for you that were? But always sort of keeping things light, keeping things bubbly, maybe sharing jokes or, or doing pranks on other players. Yeah, that was Darren Jackson, without a doubt. He was the one. He was the in a in a in a good way. He was the clown of the, the dressing room. Uh, uh, but he was always happy, always um, glad. Uh, so so he really kept. He was the kind of the the. Um, the, the glue in the dressing room in that respect but we also had other players like Paul he was always the most professional player he always came in first um, he prepared himself for training he stayed behind afterwards so uh, and you also had uh, I mean there, there were so many different uh, qualities that the players had as a human being which was really important for us but um uh, I think in total there was so many good personalities that that made uh, the team click both on and off the park. 
Yeah, so I mean, we get to the, the last three games of the season and if you're not feeling the pressure, I think the fans definitely are. And I think in the third last game, I think we, we drew and in the second last game, we drew as well to Dunfermline away. Yeah. In that moment, are, are you starting to feel the pressure then going into the final game, having slipped up in those two previous ones? Well, I, I remember that the game against Dunfermline, I think it was... Uh... Sid, who had a really good chance to to put away the goal, that could clinch the title uh, in the um, in the la- in the second to last game. Uh, but it ended up one one, as you said, and uh, then we had the week of uh, of nerves really uh, going into the last game. Uh, but we also knew that the team was good enough to win that last game because we knew that with the victory, everything would be settled. Uh, and Henrik settled the nerves uh, even. After seven minutes, wasn't in in the last game, um, but but before that, I think the the the, the week as such was was really um, really good. We did nothing out of the ordinary. We uh, we just did all the same things, all the same uh, pieces at, at practice, and I couldn't remember that we did anything uh, unusual. I think that was really important as well. Just keep us focused on what we normally would do uh, for a game. Uh, but uh, obviously the pressure increased as the, as the match day uh, approached. That's obviously something that, you know, Vim Janssen was to take a lot of credit for, for moulding that team that season and, and getting us over the line. So do you think that was a, a real sort of masterful trick from him in that final week, just to keep things the same and not try and change too much about your preparation so the pressure didn't get to the team? Oh yes, definitely. I think that's one of the, I think that's one of the most uh, underestimated uh, manager qualities that you can have to be able to simplify things. And we must not forget that uh, when we are players, we are still quite young, and we need some kind of structure and we need some kind of security around us to to be able to perform well. And I think uh, Wim and Murdo was really good at that and for the last week we just did the same things with the same sessions were the same so i think they they really they really um, uh, yeah they, they really emphasized that just do our job as best as we can and then the outcome will be as good as it can be uh, but uh, yes it's um, it's really important to to not uh, be too be too nervous or or make it uh, too serious, but uh, it's uh, it's a fine line. It, it's, it needs to be a bit of of um, uh, well to, to be sharp enough as well. You have to be on your toes, but uh, at the same time you want to be relaxed. So that's uh, one of the big clues to be to be able to to uh, go through it as a manager as well. So we get to the, the final day of the season, and for for anyone that doesn't remember it or, or doesn't know the story of it. It's, it's May 1998, we're at home to St. Johnson. We know if we win, then we win the league title for the first time in 10 years. Just go back to your memories, maybe of the morning of that match or, or travelling to the stadium. Was there a sense that something was different about this? There was a different buzz and a different feel around the place in that morning of the match? I mean, yes. Uh, obviously, I... Uh... Uh, we, well, we came to the the, the park uh, at the same time as we normally do before a game. Uh, but obviously, you could you could feel the tension as well in the in the stands. You could feel the tension outside the park as well when we came. Uh, I think people were cheering us on, of course. But they were all. I think they're also a nervous uh, because and I think everyone just knew that this is the chance we have to stop ten in a row, and there will be. Uh, there, there's, there's no. Uh, I mean, the only way to make sure that we can decide this ourselves is to win the game, and I think that showed in in all the all the people as well on the park uh, around, and around the park. But um, but yes, it was a special day. No, no doubt about that. I mean, there's there's so much tension among supporters. The game starts, but we get off to the, the perfect start. Uh, Pennant Larson scoring really early on, that must have really sort of calmed down any nerves amongst the, the players and the staff, if you had any at that moment in time, and amongst the supporters in the stadium? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, I was no surprise that Henrik scored that goal because he always rises to the occasion and uh, as he did that, that, that time as well. 
but uh, but yes, we knew that if St. Johnson score once, uh, then Rangers, Rangers can can take it home. So uh, we knew that. Uh, I mean, still, uh, when I was coming on, I don't know, 60 minutes or something, 64 yeah. minutes, 65 minutes, uh, we knew that um, there still was only 1-0. And uh, I mean, St. Johnson would only need a fluke for a goal to to be able to um, to help Rangers win the league again. So uh, I think it was only after the uh, the goal I scored that uh, both the team and the supporters, uh, because I, I can see I could I can still remember it was obviously a lot of um, cheering for for scoring the second goal as well. But I think there was equally as much uh, relief in the stands as well because I think. Then people realize that this is really possible now because uh, I even think that the St. Johnson's players they wanted to spoil this party for us, of course, but they knew that I think when there was 15 20 minutes left, they would have a hard time scoring two goals. So, uh, so I think it was uh, equally as much as a relief as uh, as anything else when we, we scored a second goal. Yeah, I mean, I'm a bit too young to, to remember the game, but I've watched it back numerous times. And as you say, we scored the first goal. There's so much sort of joyous celebrations. But as the game's going on, you can you can almost sort of hear the stadium get more and more nervous, more anxious as we go and search for that second goal. So you come off the bench, as you say. Um, when you're coming onto the park as a striker, I'm sure you're always confident you can be the person to get the goal. But are you thinking at that moment in time, I can be the person that can... Sort of write my name into history here, or what? What were you, what was going through your mind at that moment? No, I think I was. Uh, I wasn't thinking about that, but I, I knew that I could be a part of this, and I could uh, be one of the players that could uh, could even help the team to to go on and win the game. But uh, obviously, we knew that scoring one more goal would be really important for us to settle uh, both, both our nerves and also the nerves of all supporters. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think my focus coming on the park was, and I can't remember what Myrtle said to me, but when he sent me out on the park, I think he said something like, uh, be offensive, uh, be, be attacking, uh, be, uh, do not, not play the back, uh, ball backwards, just go on and attack the, the back four of, of St. Johnson. And I think... Uh, uh, the whole team wanted to do that as well, and I was, uh, yeah, I was uh, lucky enough to be um, be on the uh, the receiving end of the brilliant uh, cross from from Jackie after a good setup from Tommy Boyd. Yeah, I mean that that's the moment all Celtic fans remember. Talk us through your your memories of the, the build up to the goal. You're, you're seeing Jackie going down the line. What's your your thought process at that moment? Well, as I said, I think I was uh, I was told to be uh, threatening the the defensive uh, for the, the the back four of, of St. John's all the time, uh, and uh, it didn't look like much of a situation when Tommy had the had the ball on the sideline. Uh, but he he progressed uh, a little bit and he found Jackie with a good pass along the line. And I think I I was. I think I maybe was almost on our own half at that point when Tommy started to to progress. But um, immediately I saw that uh, if Jackie gets the ball, he he can he can be able to play the ball inside the box. And I just uh, started running as fast as I could to be uh, to be heading in for the box. And uh, Jackie were able to to play a beautiful cross for me and. Uh, yeah, I, I just did what I've been doing uh, all the time in, in, in practice, just trying to hit the ball cleanly, uh, not hard, not being trying to be smart in any way, just, just hit the ball cleanly. And uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's relieving for us as well as players to see the ball go in the net because then we know that uh, uh, this uh, was probably the moment that uh, stopped uh, Ranger from getting 10 in a row. Yeah, when that when the ball hits the back of the net, when you when you see it nestle in there, can you remember the noise and the emotion of that occasion at that moment in time? Well, I had scored a few goals before that as well, so I wasn't unfamiliar with uh, with uh, with scoring goals. But uh, obviously, as I said, uh, all the relief and all the tension that was in the game was, uh, or all the real 
relief we got from scoring the goal uh, got rid of all the tension and uh, 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 I can remember Henrik jumping on my back but it was just when I scored that goal it was just a matter of enjoying the moment because that's one of the uh, that uh, if there's one one time you should enjoy scoring a goal uh, it would be uh, in such a moment and I, I think I did I uh, I can still remember how how the next seconds were uh, after scoring the goal. So uh, that's uh, that's part of my uh, my legacy from from being at Celtic Park. Yeah, I mean, if you if you were to rewind six months earlier to the to December of nineteen ninety seven, if someone would have told you, you know, Harold, you're going to be the person to score the winning goal to stop the ten in a row. I mean, those those are moments that you live for football for, isn't it? That's that's why you get into the game for those experiences. Oh yes, definitely, and I think uh, uh, I don't think anyone thinks like that uh, because, as you said, uh, if someone told me that six months before, uh, it would be uh, we would just laugh at it. Uh, <laughs> but obviously, uh, when you are part of the team and you are playing a part, basically coming onto the pitch or uh, at least one of the eleven players, then you then you really have a chance to to um, to do something about the result in a game. So. Uh, yeah, um, as I said, I, I've been so lucky and so fortunate to be part of that squad, that 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 team that year. But uh, uh, that, uh, that it ended up me being the one that scored the second goal. Uh, that's that's obviously uh, a bit of a a bit of luck as well, because uh, there could have been other players being sent on as well. But uh, yeah, I uh, I'm just uh, I'm just really grateful for. Being able to uh, to help Celtic on on that day. I mean, that night you must have some great memories and some good stories. Did you did you just go out? Did you celebrate? What was it like? Yes, I I can I think we um, we went to an Italian restaurant uh, and celebrated. Uh, I don't know how much was planned though, because obviously uh, I think I think there was uh, stuff planned, of course, but. But we stayed at the park as well for 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 for, for hours because we we need to celebrate uh, the the game itself, of course, in the dressing room. Uh, but it was a good night, and it was. But I I I've I've had these um, I've had these moments before when I've been celebrating a uh, cup victory or a uh, uh, league victory. But it's it's uh, for all the players that are being part of this. It's also. Um, uh, oh yeah, there are. Uh, for us, uh, it, it's also kind of um, um, we, we, we're we're um, we're lost for energy uh, when the game is finished because it takes takes it basically takes the breath away because you are so focused for so long and it's just like um, it's more more like um, I, it's hard to explain, but uh, the most of the most part of the celebrations were were basically done at the park, but we we really had a good party. Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine you must be drained after you know such a long season, so much pressure on that moment and on on that day to then get over the line. Like you must have just been exhausted afterwards. Yes, of course, uh, and the whole whole squad is because you are pushing it. We're pushing each other every day at sessions and every day. At games to to be able to to perform as well as we can, uh, and for me and as the likes for me, maybe some of the other players as well. Uh, my season started uh, in my build up to the season started in January nineteen ninety seven, and it didn't end end until May ninety eight. So I had seventeen months of uh, of uh, of a long season. So uh, it was uh, it was very good to to. To finish that season with a uh, with a league title, of course, but uh, I must admit that it was also good to go away for a for a for a break when when the when the season was ended. You must not have been able to walk around Glasgow again after that moment. I mean, you must have just everyone must have been on top of you, just <laughs> wanting to get pictures or <laughs> autographs. Yes, uh, it was obviously a lot of fun uh, being. <laughs> Being part of that squad that was recognised all the time, and uh, I've been back to Glasgow a few times afterwards, and I, I really enjoy being in Glasgow, and uh, I just hope that I can get back again soon to to be part of uh, a Celtic game and 
as you said, I, um, people recognize me, but not everyone. I remember going back a year or two ago. It must have been two years ago because I haven't been there for instance, since two years now. But uh, there was uh, this taxi driver. He took me took me from the airport to the hotel, and he said that uh, because he asked me where I was from. I said I was from Norway, and he said, "Yeah, I'm a Celtic supporter." And I remember we had a good player from Norway, <laughs> and he was. <laughs> so he didn't recognize me. <laughs> so actually, it was the guy that met us at the hotel that picked up my suitcase. He said, "Do you know who you've got, the, who you've got in your, your cab?" And I said, "No," and he told him, and he was just laughing. So then he took a picture with me and sent to his friend. <laughs> but it's always nice to be back, and it's always nice to remember all those uh, memories uh, from when I from when I played there. So. Uh, Yes, I said, always nice to be back. Yeah, how do you how do you reflect on on that moment in particular and in that season in general? You know, stopping the, the ten in a row and, and lifting the title again. Well, it's one of those moments that you will remember forever, and I think it's uh, also uh, important for the club. It, it's it's really part of the club's history as well, and uh, um, I, I like to think that I I was good enough to be a part of the Celtic team but as I've said uh, many times before and as I've repeated so many times now as well is that I've been lucky to be part of this team and uh, it just makes me proud to be to be part of the Celtic history and uh, that's um, that's why it all, it's always fun to be back as well and always nice to speak to all the Celtic supporters and all the Celtic fans that I meet because it's uh, it's a part of the Celtic history that will never be forgotten so that's uh, that makes me really proud. Yeah, no, you're you're cer- certainly part of the history books here at this club. Um, you end up though, Harold. You spend another couple of years at Celtic. After that, you leave in in two thousand. How do you reflect on your Celtic career as a whole? As I said, I think you scored um, about twenty nine goals or so, or thirty goals in um, in fifty nine games. So I mean, you did have a good strike rate in the club. So how do you reflect on your time with the club? Yeah, I think it was a good uh, couple of seasons, but uh, I wish I could stay there longer, of course. But uh, at the time when uh, when the squad was changed and new players came in, uh, I think I still felt I was uh, too young to be sitting on the bench. So I wanted to move on to, to play games. And I, I did that uh, in 2000 and went to FC Copenhagen, stayed there for a year and I went back to Trondheim again. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad I moved on and, and got to play more, but... Um, uh, I wish I had played uh, longer for for Celtic. I wish I could have stayed longer. But um, when you're a player and you you want to play games, and uh, sometimes you also have to look at your own personal career to to be able to get the most of it. So uh, for me, it was the right move to to move to Copenhagen at that time. But um, but I wish I had stayed behind longer at Celtic Park. But uh, that's uh, nothing you can decide yourself. So. I'm uh, just glad I was there for the time I was. Yeah, because when you leave as well, you're saying go to Copenhagen, you win the league title, you go back to Rosenborg. I think, did you win 13 titles in a row, something like that, with, with Rosenborg as a, as a football club? So yes, I mean, it was, I think it was such a successful uh, time. Yes, it was really a successful time. And I I, I, uh, I think I had, well, obviously winning the league with Celtic, obviously uh, winning the league with uh, with uh, with FC Copenhagen and uh, before that, winning the league and the cup and with Rosenborg and also winning the cup with uh, with Bodo Glimt. So I've been really lucky. I've had so many titles and uh, I've been fortunate to play with so many good players uh, through my career. So uh, so uh, knowing that Celtic has been one of those clubs is uh, is uh, is really good. Yes, it is. You must have a. A cabinet somewhere, or, or all the medals in a loft somewhere. They must be, they must be pouring out for them. Oh, I wish I had. Uh, <laughs> I do have most of the. I do have most of the. Uh, my uh, medals and my uh, trophies, but uh, and a lot of the the shirts I've uh, swapped as well. But I was sadly uh, admit that. Uh, most of them are in the basement, hidden somewhere. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's not a cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's been some career anyway for you when, you when you look back on it all. Just to finish off, Harold, I just want to go through some, some quick-fire questions on your Celtic career. I think some of the answers are going to be a bit self-explanatory, but we'll go through them anyway. And if you need to repeat yourself, uh-huh. that's fine, because I'm sure you will. Um, so first of okay. all, what would you say is your, your favourite goal in your time at Celtic? 
No, that's easy. <laughs> Second goal against St. Johnson. Yes. Yeah. And the next question was going to be favourite game, but again, is that probably an easy one? My favourite game? Yeah. Well, that must be St. Johnson game as well, <laughs> uh, which makes up all the history for us. Yeah, I think there's going to be a scene here. Um, favourite memory yes. from your time at Celtic? Now, that could be a moment from a match. It could be something away from the field, something you just remember really fondly about your time at Glasgow and, and Celtic. Uh, I must say um, Angie and John. Angie's sadly not with us anymore. She was uh, uh, the, the kit lady uh, together with John. Uh, they are important people that are around the club all the all the time, and maybe not get all the credit they they deserve. But uh, they were certainly part of making the dressing room such a friendly place and such a uh, a good place to be. So they have to be, be mentioned. And mm-hmm. um, best atmosphere you experienced at Celtic Park? Oh, uh, maybe after the game against St. Johnson, uh, when the game was finished. But also uh, playing the old firm game against strangers at Celtic Park as my f- starter, uh, first starter was uh, was definitely uh, uh, something to remember. Mm-hmm. One thing you miss about Glasgow? I wish I could say the rain, but I got some rain here as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and what do I miss about Glasgow? Um, I think I must say the people. Uh, because uh, the um, the Scottish mentality is so so alike the Norwegian mentality, so um, I really, yeah, I uh, I think that's why I also go back as much as I can because I uh, I like to be with the the Scottish people and obviously the Celtic fans, but uh, I think that must be one of the answers, yes. Mm-hmm. And finally, I think you've already answered this. So the the best player you played alongside at the club. Yeah, that was Henrik, without a doubt. But I mean, there's a few others as well that come very close. But uh, he was uh, he was uh, a notch above everyone else, and uh, I'm really proud to be a part of uh, the team that he was playing. Mm-hmm. Brilliant, Harold. Well, I mean, I'm sure if you ask many Celtic fans in Glasgow what their favourite memory is as a Celtic fan, I'm sure your name pops up along the way. So thank you so much for joining us for this podcast. And- Really pleased to get you on, and I'm sure the fans will love hearing about those memories again. So thank you so much. I hope so. Thank you so much, too. Thank you, Harold. Take care. Thanks. Thank you.